this is working yet. Let's flip the sun and we want to do this so you see everything. I'm just going to give it a second to see. Oh, there we go. So it is kicking now. All right. Mm. Okay, so I'm logging things up just to make sure that we got everything available in case people want to, to watch live. If not, this is going to be recorded so that you guys can watch this whenever you want. Obviously, if you're hearing this, you're watching a recording. I don't know why I'm saying this. Uh, anyways, hello, guys. Um, I'm going to be reviewing last year's midterm exam. Uh, we've got an upcoming exam this Saturday for HR. Um, so what I want to do, what I typically do, is just go through last year's exam uh, and give you guys some of the pointers in terms of the highs and lows and what's easy and what's not easy with the exam. Okay, so we're talking about the, the midterm. Uh, so the midterm is covering all chapters that we've covered so far, chapters one to six. Uh, so these are five weeks of topics that we've covered thus far. Um, the last week is actually two chapters, recruitment and selection. So, uh, so we'll, we'll do that. And I see some comments already coming up. How many, how many questions can you expect to see? There are 72 questions. It is 100% multiple choice. Uh, I think if you do the math, six chapters, each chapter gets 12 questions. So 12 times six is 72. So I, that's how I get my, that's how I get the answers. Or that, not answers. That's how I got the, got the questions. <clears throat> so if you guys have any comments, questions, fire away in the chat, and I'll, I'll answer them. If not, let's just get going. I'm going to do this sucker in an hour. Okay, so I'm going to condense it. I'm going to go through it fairly fast. If you have any questions, get me to slow down. Uh, but we're just going to simply go through one chapter at a time. I'm going to give you, the way I structure this is I give you two kind of like standard multiple choice questions, okay? Uh, in, in On the exam, there will be nine questions similar to this. And then I also give you three multiple choice questions that are built around like a mini case, okay? So you'll, you'll get a deeper understanding as we go along. Somebody's asking if we can bring a cheat sheet. No, no cheat sheets. It's not open book. Um, you can bring a calculator. Don't use your iPhone. Or your, or your phone for whatever reason, don't expect that I'll allow that. Okay, so which of the following is not a key component of human resource management? Okay, so this is, okay, so th this whole, this whole, like this slide is from our first class. So I'm sure you don't remember this other than the fact that I showed you a picture of my foot. Uh, but there, well, there was some content that I talked about during this lecture. Um, basically, the answer is vision development. Okay, we talk about the idea of job analysis is a chapter we talked about. Okay, recruitment is another chapter that we talked about the last chapter. Okay, compensation, uh, I'm going to do a little, a little something I shouldn't do, but I'm going backwards. Compensation is something that we will talk about, probably my favorite chapter, in a couple of weeks. Okay, so don't, so you'll see that in a couple of weeks. Okay, so as these are three core chapters that we talked about in the textbook, they are all related to HR. So vision development, that's more of an OB topic. That's a leadership topic. That's not really about uh, HR. Okay. Uh, number 18, okay, 18 on, on last year's exam. Implementing paternity leave policy within an organization is most likely to be, is the most likely to associate with which of the following HR functions. Okay. So this one's a, this one's an interesting one. Okay. Because as you read through the options, um, you, you think about, okay, which one is it related to? So we did talk about paternity leave during our first class. And okay, so when we talk about paternity leave, paternity leave is when, is when a male takes time off because their partner or you know, the wife or the mom uh, delivers a baby. Okay, maternity is for the mom, paternity is for the dad. Okay, that kind of idea. So dad's taking time off. So you could technically, be, you could be like, well, is that health related? Well, not really, but like job analysis related. You know, somebody taking leave, it's not really job analysis. Is it taking health time off? Well, potentially, you, you could make the argument that it's uh, related to work-life balance, so maybe. However, we don't actually cover occupational health and safety until after the midterm, so you can cross that one off. Performance management, and that one we don't talk about until after the midterm as well, so you could probably cross that one. So I don't know why I included those two options, because they're not really related to content ahead of the mid, uh, like before, that we covered before the midterm, so you don't really have to know those. So I don't know why those aren't even good, you know, 
distractor questions. So in any case, it was really between job analysis and HR planning. It's HR planning. If somebody's taking a year off, you need to be able to fill that spot. Okay, so you're planning ahead to make sure you have people to fill that gap. Somebody, somebody's done the calculation. 1.67 minutes per question. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, somebody's asking if these are on the exam. These are 100% not on the exam. However, if you get these ideas, you'll be in pretty good shape. Okay, so this is what I mean. For every chapter, there are three questions. Here's two of them here. I got another one on the next slide. That's built around this mini case. Okay, so this mini case gives you some perspective as to what you're going to see. Okay, so you are the HR director at Microsoft. I love making names for organizations on exams. A little FYI, if you, if you couldn't tell from that clever name, is a mid-sized technology company. Microsoft is currently facing a significant retention problem. So over the past, so if you guys don't know retention problems, retention is is when you have an issue with turnover. People are leaving the organization, so you want to retain them, you want to keep them, okay? So if Microsoft is facing a problem with retention, it's because people are choosing to leave the organization. Over the past year, the organization has seen a noticeable increase in employee turnover, right? I guess that makes sense why there's a retention problem. Uh, with several talented young employees, with high potential leaving for other promotional opportunities outside of the organization. The retention issues have started to affect the company's productivity and morale as leaders are struggling to find ways to retain workers. Okay. The HR department has been tasked with addressing this problem. Okay. So basically you have a bunch of little contacts, probably some little hints in this little uh, paragraph here, but let's, let's look at the question first to see which of these we're going to try to focus in on. Okay. So to address this retention issue, which of the following policies, opportunities should you consider implementing? Um, okay, so here, here's a bunch of the different policies or opportunities. Okay, so, so here, they're, they're potentially all could be valid. Okay, so let's see, which one, uh, retirement benefits? Is there anything about older individuals wanting to retire? No, we're talking about several young, talented employees. So younger people typically associate with the idea that they're going to get married. They associate with the idea that they're going to have children. Okay. So my immediately when I'm reading this, I see young people. I'm like zooming in parental benefits. Okay. And, and it is actually the case. Um, I would continue. I know the answer, so I, I clicked it. But I would continue reading to make sure there was nothing around... Um, uh, people getting injured on the job, because that would suggest safety training, or people wanting to learn more about uh, becoming more high tech, which would be more technical training. Okay? To address the company's declining morale and productivity, you're considering implementing a flexible work arrangement that may be more accommodating to your workers' busy home schedules. I guess that really relates to them having kids. Which of the following may be an appropriate flexible work arrangement? Okay. So based on this, performance scheduling is not really a work arrangement. A job sharing potentially, but job sharing would really just mean that they're cutting somebody's job in, in half, that there's no real indication you want high performers to be working as much as possible. So job sharing doesn't really make sense. The compressed work week uh, makes sense because that's something that would help people on an ongoing time. Uh, wellness days are you know, giving somebody two days off a year to have a well a day to recover from weather. but you know frankly having two days off is not going to help people on an, a regular basis so a flexible work arrangement a compressed work week would be what i would be looking for here uh, somebody's asked why is it parental benefits up above um, so when you're looking at the the idea it's here it's uh, so over the past year the organization has seen a noticeable increase in employee turnover yes with several talented young employees with high potential for leaving for other organizations. So, so you're really concerned with the idea of these young, talented employees leaving for other promotional opportunities. Typically, young, young employees are, you know, they may be married, they may not be, but they typically don't have children. I know it's subtle. I don't exactly say people wanting to have kids. I, I do not come out and scream they want to be parents. I think that would be too obvious because frankly, when you're dealing with you know people in real life and you're dealing in an organization, you don't you don't ask you're not going to talk to somebody and be like, hey, I'm going to have kids. I want I want a parental benefit. Some of them might, but in reality, you have to read between the lines a little bit. Okay, so if we're talking about younger employees, you typically think that it's something around uh, marriage, something around travel, something around high tech, something around 
kids, right? That kind of that kind of idea. If we're talking about older workers, that would be more about retirement. That would be more about uh, phased retirement. That would be more about pensions. That that kind of idea. Okay, so you have to know your audience from uh, from the employee workforce perspective. All right, so here's the last, the third question associated with that same case. So you recently started offering the flexible work arrangement to your staff. However, you notice that some of your staff are using the newly offered flexible work arrangement. Cool. Which of the following is the best way to increase the employee adoption of the new HR policy? So in this case, it doesn't actually say what the flexible work arrangement is. Okay, so I guess in this question, it doesn't really matter. So this is more about the idea of how can you communicate and increase the adoption of a new particular HR policy. Okay. So in this case, it would be increased compensation for those considering leaving the organization. Uh, does it say anything up here about money? People are interested in money. Uh, started effect. Rather, so they have other promotional opportunities outside of the organization. So it could be, so it's, you know, it's the idea that people want to get into like a managerial or a leadership role. Okay, it's not really talking about compensation, but but I'd keep that you know as a maybe. Foster a positive work culture that emphasizes teamwork. And nothing really here says talks about the idea of teamwork being an issue. So that's not that's not right. Uh, encourage managers to lead by example by using flexible work arrangements. Uh, leaders are struggling to find ways. Hmm, interesting. But actually, if we look at the last option, it's the idea of encouraging cross-functional training and earn internal promotions. Internal promotions are really the big issue. People are leaving because they're receiving promotional opportunities from other organizations. So it's the idea that if you can, if you can offer more promotions inside the organization, they're not going to leave to chase those promotions outside. Um, people are asking what chapter is this from? This is from chapter one. Uh, perfect. Somebody's asking that technically all of these options could work. Now I do have to, yeah. So, so I have to say when for these particular questions, okay. There are some questions, there are some answers in this case. Um, what's the best way to increase adoption? If you pay people more, it's it's probable they're not going to leave the organization, okay? Would that necessarily mean they're going to increase the adoption of the new HR policy? No, right? So you have to be really careful and you have to be really focused on what the question is actually asking about and what you're, um, what you're, what you're trying to get at. Okay. There are some questions that are uh, good, but then there's generally one answer that really stands out and is uh, the correct answer. So in this case, because we're talking about internal promotions here and people are leaving for uh, other promotional opportunities, that's the, kind of a slam dunk in this case as to what the answer would be. Okay. So I do have to acknowledge it's not like there's going to be three completely wrong answers and one right answer. Uh, there's generally one really good answer and three average answers. Maybe one, like, you know, you got to be a, kind of a dummy to, to, to select that answer. But um, in any case, I should also note that last year's midterm, this exam that I'm taking up right now, the class average was 74%. I have never received a class average as high as 74%. I, you know, don't hate me, but I'm hoping that this year's class average is somewhere in the 60s. But if you guys are as good as last year's class, or maybe if this exam is as easy, uh, then you'll get in the 70s as well with your class average. Okay? I will never decrease a class average. I will only ever increase increase a class average if it's needed. Okay? No promises, though. Okay, so five. Which job analysis method would be most appropriate for a physically demanding job? So a quick review uh, questionnaires, interviews, work sampling is not a job analysis method for collecting data. So that's not really good. Um, and when somebody's doing a physically demanding job, the first two allow the, allow the respondent to lie. So that's not a good idea. If somebody's doing something physically demanding, you probably want to watch them in person. You want to see them sweat. 
So the answer would be D. No, it, it would be D, because if somebody's doing a physically demanding job, you want to make sure that they're they're doing it correctly. You want to make sure that they're not lying in terms of what, with regards to what they're doing. Um, and you want to make sure that their form and function are correct. You know, when you're lifting something heavy, lift with your legs, not with your back. Okay. Did you lift with your back in an interview? Or, yeah, of course I lifted with my legs, but you know, it's better to just observe them for something like that. Uh, two, uh, which of the following is an outcome of job analysis? So if you guys remember, there was one slide, okay, that I had job analysis at the top, and then I had all the different chapters down below, okay? So here we're going to be talking about the different chapters in the textbook. Uh, so hiring is the selection, job selection. Uh, performance evaluations, again, we don't cover that until after. Uh, training and development plans, you know, to be honest, I kind of, yeah, I kind of did a bad job. I, I must acknowledge I put in topics that were post midterm in the textbook. My my you know my bad here a little bit. I should acknowledge that I did include these concepts on the one slide, so I don't feel too bad. But I should have probably picked topics uh, chapters that we did cover before the midterm. Uh, employee employee payroll processing. I suppose you could like broadly say this is related to compensation. Um, so that's that's fine. Um, which of the following is an outcome? Oh, I guess I, I guess I kind of, this is a, this is a bad, bad question. I have to admit. But which of the following is an outcome of job analysis? It's not actually. You have to go and I said the employee selection process. The selection process is correct, but the hiring decision is not. Okay. So in this case, I was being really specific. So it's this. The hiring decision is one step in the selection process, so that is incorrect. Um, in this case, uh, employee performance evaluations, the evaluations are incorrect. The performance management would be related to job analysis, but not the specific evaluations for employees. And the payroll processing, like I said, this is compensation in general is related to job analysis, but not the actual processing of somebody's pay. However, employee training and development plans those are general. I didn't say a specific step in the training process. Uh, so as a result, this would be considered an outcome of job analysis. Okay, continuing down the job analysis questions. ABC Manufacturing is a large industrial company that has been experiencing a high turnover rate among its production line workers. The HR department suspects that the issue may be related to, uh, to how the jobs on the production line are structured and whether they are adequately whether they adequately meet the needs and expectations of the employees. To address this, ABC Manufacturing has initiated a job analysis process to better understand the roles and responsibilities of production line workers. Okay, so again, you've read this, you've got some got some hints going on in your mind, but let's dive into the question first and see what we need to focus in on with this broader question, okay? So what is the primary objective of conducting a job analysis at ABC Manufacturing? Well, they kind of tell you in the last line here, okay? So this last line is to better understand the roles and responsibilities, yeah, to better understand. So that one, to be honest, this one isn't really like an HR content question. This is, did you read the question? Because the last line actually says that's what it is, okay? So that one's pretty straightforward. Now, which of the following methods can ABC Manufacturing use to collect data for the job analysis process? Okay, so in this case, this is another form of data collection for using job analysis. Okay, so of these employee satisfaction surveys, financial reports is, is a, probably a no. We didn't talk about that in class. Observing workers potentially offering promotions is also not a data collection method. So the, really the only one, the only straight up um, data collection that we talked about in class is observing employees at work. We did talk about surveys a little bit, um, but not surveys and related to job satisfaction. We talked about surveys and related to job analysis. Okay, so learning more about the specifics about somebody's job. Okay, and the last one, what is a potential outcome of a successful job analysis? Okay, so in this case, let's, talk, let's somebody's ex they're experiencing high turnover rate among production workers, so I would assume you want to retain those production workers. Okay, so is there anything related to increased turnover among production line workers? I don't think you want to increase the turnover. I hope I didn't write a typo. 
uh, greater job satisfaction and productivity among the workers. Reduced demand, decrease in, oh my God, what did I have to say? Okay, good. Whew, I thought I made a mistake here because the increased turnover. No, you don't want to increase turnover. You want to decrease the turnover. Want me to decrease the turnover? Greater job satisfaction and productivity. Do I have a words here that actually say that we should do that uh, to better understand the roles of production workers? Okay, good. Experience a high turnover among its production line. No one suspects that the issue may be related to how the jobs on the production line are structured and whether they adequately made. Okay, perfect. All right, so it's all about the idea. You want to you want to keep these workers retained. You want to keep them as happy and as productive as possible, um, and that's really the the end goal for job analysis. Another way to phrase this is to decrease turnover. Okay, so it's the opposite of A, or very much in line with with B. Okay. Are there any questions? Oh, Pavi, what do you mean? What question when you say, why can't it be A? Oh my God, I think it's because there's a delay here. I'm seeing the questions after, I'm seeing your comments after. I've already uh, gone past that question. <laughs> I will be making the, the midterm a little bit harder. I'll give you an example of how I'm making it harder though. Uh, I think that this is what I did. Um, instead of having four options here, A, B, C, D, I'm also having an E. Okay, so technically I think it's going to be harder because there's more distractions, um, but I, the actual content of the questions I don't think will be any harder for the previous question. Okay, okay so why did you want D? Pavi wanted... Why can't it be A? A. Ah, okay. So Pavi wanted A for conducting employee satisfaction surveys. Um, so what methods could they use for it? Let's, let's see if we can do it. So for me, it is less about... So if we were to say that... Because like employee surveys is one way to collect information related to job analysis. So surveys versus employing, uh, observing employees at work. So this middle line, okay? So the first line is all about there's high turnover and that's the issue. Uh, the middle line is all about the idea of uh, how the production line are structured and whether they are adequate, whether they adequately meet the needs and expectations of the employees. So one way to learn more about whether employees are receiving everything that they need to would be to simply watch them conduct their work, observing them. Uh, are they falling short? Do they have to walk, you know, do they have to go out of their way to, I don't know, it's kind of, so put yourself in like a production line, okay? So you're on a production line and, and you're working and you don't have to move, but maybe you need to, uh, I don't know if it's structured weird and you have to walk 10 steps that way and then walk 10 steps back every every minute to get a tool or something like that, then things wouldn't be as structured as close as possible. I, I, I do think obser observations of employees makes the most sense here. Um, yeah, because you, you, you're ob observing them on a, on a production line. I'm sorry. I, uh, let me see if I can explain it better though because that is a good point because like, I actually think that an interview might even be best, to be honest, because if you want to ex understand the employee's needs and expectations, you talk to them. Interviews would be best. The, th the issue with the surveys, particularly the satisfaction surveys, are all around the idea of how satisfied are you. It doesn't really give you the, the added context of how to address and how to improve things. Maybe that's what uh, the angle I would take. Are you satisfied? Yes. No, you're not satisfied. It doesn't give you any context to, to go a little deeper in terms of what else should be done. All right, HR planning. Uh, somebody's asking if you should read and review the textbook as well. Uh, my general rule of thumb for studying for this exam, uh, re review the slides, review the notes you took in my class, review the old exams I have on this YouTube channel. And if you have all the hours in the day, then you can also read the textbook. Okay, reading the textbook will help. It reiterates concepts um, that we talk about in class 100%. 
but your best bang for your buck from what I've heard in the past is reviewing old exam questions. Okay, let's talk about this. Uh, which of the following is not a step in the HR planning process? So we talked about the idea of, you know, that football, you know, you're, you're setting up a, like a Super Bowl party, okay? And you're trying to order pizza, right? That kind of, if you remember that class, you're forecasting the future needs, yes. You're conducting job analysis, no. You're developing a recruitment strategy, ooh, no. And, you, and which of the following is not a step? Implementing performance management systems. What the heck was I thinking here? Why was this question? Like, now I have to lean into this. I haven't looked at this question in a while. Okay, so definitely not the first one. Okay, is not a part of HR planning, or, or it is a part. And then job analysis you needed in advance in developing a recruitment strategy. I guess that's the idea you need to bring people in. Yeah, so it's the idea of trying to engage people um, in HR planning. But implementing somebody's uh, performance management. Uh, evaluating somebody's individual performance is definitely the furthest from HR planning. Okay, let's take a look at this. What factors should be considered when conducting a gap analysis in HR planning? Okay, labor supply, labor demand. This is, so this is a more of a traditional question with HR planning. Okay, so how much how much labor you currently have, how much labor you're going to need a skills inventory and all of the above. Now I know some of you are probably like, oh, you need A and B, like, but there's no option for A and B, but technically you need all of them because the skills inventory contributes to an understanding of your labor supply. So in my mind, theoretically, A and C are the same. Somebody's asking if this is being recorded. Yes, it's going to be recorded, and I'm going to give everybody the, the link in class so you can review it. If you don't have all the time tonight or if I'm taking too long, you can review it the night before if you like. Okay, this question, Bike Me. Again, another cool name. I enjoy that. Uh, is a large chain of 55 retail stores facing challenges related to employee turnover and workforce planning? I mean, i got to change this context. Employee turnover is like, it's very, it's a big challenge, it seems. Uh, the HR department has decided to implement a Markov analysis to better understand employee transitions between different job roles within the company. This, aim, this analysis aims to identify patterns and trends of employee movements, provide insights into how to improve talent retention and succession planning. While you are unable, or sorry, while you were able to find a preliminary draft of the Markov analysis, you notice that several of the cells in the table were not completed. Okay, so here, here, you know, for example, these these cells aren't completed. Okay, um, I don't know how, how you'd, you know, I guess you're taking over somebody who started this and didn't finish it. Okay, now, okay. So let's go to the question down below. So what is the primary purpose of implementing a Markov bike analysis or a Markov analysis at bike me? Okay. So in this case, uh, it kind of says it here. The analysis aims to identify patterns and trends uh, of employee movements. Okay. So if you look at D to understand employee movements between job roles. Okay. And that is the answer. Ah, oh, perfect. Alex, you get nailed it. Cool. Okay. The next one, okay, so this one you actually have to fill in what I call this is like a bit of a Sudoku puzzle, um, but when considering the bike mechanics for next year, okay, so look here, you have bike mechanics, okay, bike mechanics here, bike mechanics here, okay, you can see the bike mechanics are completely filled out here, so you can understand how the, okay, so just a quick review as to what, how Markov analysis works, okay, so the column on uh, the left, refers to here are the the big spaces, big spaces. These are the jobs, store manager, bike mechanic, cashier, salesperson. And the N refer to the positions within each of these jobs. And these are the current, this is the current year. All other columns refer to what's going to happen next year. Okay, so here look at bike mechanic, for example, of the 420 bike mechanic, 410 bike mechanics, 10 of them want to become a store manager. 370 want to retain, remain a bike mechanic. None of them want to be a cashier. 20 salespeople and 10 want to leave the organization as a whole. Okay, so basically for this one, you have to populate the cells here. And when you do populate the cells, here are the answers that you would get. 
okay so one quick note some of you are like okay well I don't know how actually I would I would do this to begin with well you would take one one row or one column okay which is completely filled out except for one okay in this particular case because you know that 110 needs to add up with all of these okay in the remaining row okay so in this case you'd say 110 I don't know what this number is minus 5 minus 100 Okay, and, and then you can populate five here. When you populate the five here, you notice that it is the only you only have one cell up here that is missing. Okay, so in this case, you know that this entire column adds up to the bottom of it. So it's, you'd say 65 minus five minus 10 is 50. Okay, and you can keep kind of going along. Okay, so in this case, 55 minus 50 minus 0 minus 5 oh there's no more leftovers here you keep going along until all of these are completed okay because you're going to need to complete them all and then when considering so let's go back to the actual question when considering bike mechanics next year there is likely to be so you want to compare the bike mechanics for uh, your expected supply for next year versus your current supply this year to suggest and assuming that the demand does not change okay you will have more bike mechanics next year than you do this year so that would suggest that there is a labor labor surplus for bike mechanics you have more bike mechanics than you need okay that's how you get the answer there all right uh, so the based on the Markov analysis, what type of supply or demand strategy should be implemented on salespersons? So let's take a look at these salespersons. So here we go. We have 155, and let's compare that to 110. So we have a labor surplus, 100%. We have many more salespeople than next year than this year. So typically when you have something like this, okay, so again, if you remember the bathtub, Okay, the bathtub idea, if you have too much water in the tub, you stop water coming into the tub. So turn off the tap and you pull out the drain to get people, you know, to get the water to flow out quicker so the water goes down. You have too many people in the organization, so you stop hiring people. Okay, good, that works. And then you also pull the drain to encourage people to leave. That works, okay? So when you have too many people, okay? Now that, I want to put a caveat, that is when you're looking at a single job. However, in an organization, okay, it's more comprehensive. In an organization, maybe you don't want people to, um, to just leave the organization unless you have more people than needed for every single job. Sometimes you have more people needed in some jobs, such as salespeople, and not enough people need, ha like you don't have enough people for the supply in other jobs, such as the cashier. So you might try to shift people from the salespeople to the cashier role, okay? So while hiring freeze might jump out at you because you're looking solely at salespeople and you're thinking, I've got more salespeople than needed, the actual best case scenario for this organization is actually a horizontal transfer. And I, you know, if it was a short answer question, I'd say, well, where would you transfer them? You would transfer them to the cashier because they are in need of people, okay? That's the logic there. Uh, I think somebody said they wanted me to recap about uh, the last question about labor surplus. Okay, uh, if you didn't get this, I'll tackle this quickly. So it's just like this. Okay, so when you have a scenario like this, you, we're asking about uh, the comparing the supply of bikes, bike mechanics, to the current state of bike mechanics. Okay, so in this case, can I uh, actually? I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull out my Pull up my marker for this. Okay, uh, so in this case, you you know that 110 is the sum of this row. So you'd say this is 105. 110 minus 105 is 5. Okay, that is what you'd say there. And then you look at this, you know, because if you look at the other rows, there's two gaps. There's two dots here, two m, two vacancies because we can't use those. Uh, so we have to go here. We look at the the vertical components. And we say here 65 is the sum of this column 
So we say 15 here, so this looks like the answer is, oh wow, that's bad, 50. Yeah, I'll just go across and, and add those up, okay? So that's how you'd go about populating this table, okay? Once you have that table complete, you're comparing this 420 to the, to the 410, okay? So you're trying to figure out, is there a labor surplus? Is there a shortage? Or is it the same? Or is there not enough information provided? I didn't really have a good... I didn't really have a good uh, answer, uh, a fourth answer, so I made kind of a lousy one up. You know, that's obviously wrong. Now, in this case, you have more bike mechanics next year than you have this year, so that would suggest you have a surplus. You have, uh, and I, it's a typo as well, <laughs> not that I'm looking at it, it's a sup, supper loss. Um, you have more, more bike mechanics than you currently have, so you have more than needed surplus. Okay. Um, somebody's asking for when you would have an example of for hiring freeze in this case. Uh, so in this case, if you had more people, uh, you know, in this case, if you have more people than you currently have for every single job, you would 100% do a hiring freeze. You'd 100% encourage people to leave, to retire. You would do that. But that's only if every single job, uh, like in this case, the 420 is higher, great. The 65 is higher, great. If the cashier was higher or the same, or you know, th then you would not consider horizontal transfer. You would do the hiring freeze. Or if I said something up here in, sorry, I don't know where my pen is. Uh, if I said something up here and I said, hey, uh, salespeople cannot transition into the role cashier then you would not consider horizontal transfer and that would be a hiring freeze scenario okay so in this case you'd have to look up above look at the table look up below and then kind of put it all together this is a tougher question okay this is a tougher question um there's no getting around it there's math involved there's some thinking so uh, this is a tough one okay however you know 74 percent so people still did well All right, um, let's go to this question. So which legislation in Canada regulates occupational health and safety standards? Uh, this one's kind of funny. I have occupational health and safety, occupational health and safety. So, you know, it shouldn't surprise you there. Um, which federal legislation in Canada prohibits discrimination based on the protected grounds? Uh, so we talked about this. I even, we did the whole like uh, restaurant, uh, force people to wear certain types of clothing. Um, so I hope you remember that. I hope that this particular form of legislation stood out. We talked about uh, the fact that it's a discrimination based on protect, protected grounds. We list, listed what those protected grounds were, ageism, for example, sexism, things like that. Okay. All right, Mike Ayer. If you can see the trend in the, these organizational names, you, if you didn't know my name, you would by the end of my exam. Okay, so Mike Ayer is a growing airline. Uh, is facing a complex HR challenge related to bona fide occupational requirement. Uh, so a B4, thank God it's not turnover. Um, the airline industry is highly competitive and Mike Air is known for a commitment to safety and customer service. Okay, so I'm mentioning a B4, legal requirements, but I'm also mentioning health and safety, okay? Uh, however, a recent issue has arisen regarding the requirement for flight attendants to meet specific height and weight standards. Interesting, as so we talked about this a little bit in class already. Some employees argue that these standards discriminate against them while others believe they are crucial for health, for safety and efficiency. Okay, so in this case, I'm leaning into the idea of what do you need to do in order for it to be considered a B4? What do you need to do in order for height and weight requirements to be considered a B4? Okay, let's get there. So the first question. So the first question, why does Mike Air have height and weight standards for flight attendants? To discriminate against? No. To enhance the brand image? No. To save on unicorn? No to ensure that they can easily reach the overhead compartments. So this one would suggest that it is closest to the job requirements. This is the one that is closest to having anything related to the job requirements that they do. They have to reach the overhead compartments. They have to perform safety duties, yes. Uh, and as a result, that is the correct answer. It's nothing to do about cutting costs. 
by saving on your it is nothing to do with that okay nothing to do about brand image as well no it, it is about does this meet the job requirements period okay okay uh the next question what is the potential legal implication if mike airs heightened weight standards uh if they're challenged by employees uh, would they be forced to hire individuals who don't meet those standards? Uh, well, no, that's, if they don't meet the standards, then they wouldn't be forced to hire them. Uh, would need to eliminate all physical requirements? Well, not necessarily, because there might be some physical requirements, which are part of the job description. May need to prove that the standards are a bona fide occupational requirement and not discriminatory. Yes. <laughs> okay, so at the end of the day, if somebody challenges the idea that you need to meet a certain height and weight requirement, you need to prove that indeed these standards are valid and are associated with specific job requirements. You need to have a certain height and weight in order to perform your duties on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the best I could do in terms of like for a multiple choice question, in terms of like testing your knowledge in this. Um, this, this question would be, in my opinion, significantly harder if you had to write out an answer rather than seeing an answer in front of you. But regardless, this is certainly a, a challenging question. All right, the last one here. How can Mike Air ensure that their height and weight requirements are defensible as a bona fide occupational requirement? Uh, anytime we're talking about some making something defensible, I hope that you have data. Okay, eliminating all physical requirements. We already talked about that. That's a silly answer because there might be some physical requirements which are required, such as, uh, I don't know, having uh, having vision or something like that. I don't know. Now, certain phys physical requirements which might be required for flight attendants. Uh, by not hiring any flight attendants who exceed the standards, oh, you, you certainly wouldn't want to get high performers. No, that doesn't make sense. Uh, by providing evidence that the standards are necessary for the job. Again, it's this idea data matters, okay? So providing evidence that the standards are necessary for the safety and uh, because of job requirements. So it's contributing to job performance, okay? That's the answer there. All right, there we go. Recruitment, we have two chapters left. I, what, how are we doing for time? Oh, we got, we got, we're good. We're going to be within the one hour. Okay, so recruitment. Okay. What is the primary goal of recruitment in HRM? Okay, so if we're trying to recruit people, I always said recruitment is different than selection. Recruitment is trying to get people to apply for a job, and selection is trying to, once people have applied, you're picking out which one is the best person from the bunch. Um, so is recruitment about training people? No. Is it about enhancing job satisfaction? No. Is it about identifying and attracting qualified talents to apply for the job? Bingo. Okay. So again, remember friends with benefits. Myla Kunitz, she was a recruiter. She identified Justin Timberlake and attracted him to apply for the job and actually worked with him uh, to ensure that he would take it so that she would get her uh, recruit recruitment bonus. Um, which of the following is not a common source of recruitment? Okay. So this one's interesting. Uh, okay. So it's the idea of in class, we talked about the idea of recruitment can take place in on multiple different platforms. Which of the, which of these is not possible? Is, does not commonly occur? Job boards and online platforms. Yes, of course. You want like uh, think of like monsters, monsters, what, monster, not monster. I was thinking like monsters Inc. No, uh, monster. Indeed. Uh, I don't know, is there other online platforms to like look for jobs? Now, employee referrals, yes, that's another another good one as well. Yeah, my friend can work for, can work for you. That's a common source for recruitment. Social media networks, uh, yes, right? So it's the idea that uh, LinkedIn, for example. Performance appraisal criteria, uh, no. <laughs> so it's the so performance appraisal criteria, is, this is how you would evaluate somebody. So how do you evaluate somebody does not actually lead to uh, is not a common source for recruitment. Sorry. Um, tech Innovations Inc., uh, a rapidly growing tech company, is facing recruitment challenges as it expands its operations. The HR department is struggling to attract and hire top talent. Okay, so in this case, I've organized questions by chapter. Okay, so in your mind, you already know this question is about recruitment. In the exam, 
I do not organize them in this manner. So you're going to have to try to figure out as you're reading the question, what the heck am I talking about? So what I, what I, I would recommend is you take a pencil or a pen or whatever. And as soon as you're reading something and you think you know the chapter that you're that I'm talking about, you circle it to say, OK, this is I can get in the recruitment mode now. OK, tip, because what I don't do is I don't ask you questions from multiple chapters to make it as challenging as possible. No, I typically have this set of questions like for these three sets of three questions related to this mini case is all related to the same chapter. Okay. So in this case, as soon as you identify recruitment, get your mind in the recruitment mindset. So despite offering competitive compensation packages, which essentially means I'm paying people a lot of money, the company is not meeting its recruitment goals. Okay. So this is another hint. We're talking about recruitment. HR is tasked with addressing these challenges to ensure the organization can continue to grow and innovate. Okay, so to be honest, there's not really a ton of hints and context up here other than the fact that it says we're talking about recruitment. All right, well, let's try to see what we're talking about here. So what is the primary issue tech individuals is facing in recruitment? Uh, here we go. It's pretty much you know, pretty straightforward. Um, trying to uh, attract and retain top talent okay so that's pretty much the quest the problem with all <laughs> recruitment challenges um, how can tech innovations Inc improve its recruitment efforts effectively so it talks about they already offer competitive compensation so you know uh, lowering salaries is the opposite of what you would do. And plus, they already offer competitive compensation, so that's not correct. By limiting the use of online, so that is the opposite, you would increase in order to improve your recruitment efforts. By expanding the candidate search to include diverse sources, yes. Uh, by reducing the number of job openings would also be the opposite. Okay, so in this case, I give you three answers which are opposite and one answer that's correct, hoping that you're like, oh man, this is the only one that's different. Um, but no, if you read it carefully, it's pretty clear. Uh, you want, if you want to increase your uh, recruitment efforts, you make it broader. You're not going to say, oh, I'm only looking for um, people with a specific skill set. I want to look at people with multiple skills. Make the your candidate search broader. And, you know, kind of like when you're on Tinder and you're just like, I've got a really particular person that I'm into. I really like, I got this one look that I really like. I really like this look and I, I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, you like this one look and then you're just like, oh, I'm not getting any matches. So as soon as you expand beyond that look, you get a bunch of hits. There you go. It's the same kind of idea. Okay. Expand your recruitment effort. Look broad. Okay. This last question for this mini case. Now, what could be a potential consequence of Tech Innovations Inc.'s recruitment challenges if left unaddressed? Uh, all right, well, let's see. Um, slower company growth because you're not recruiting enough people. That sounds like a reasonable answer. Increased innovation, no. Reduced competition, no. Higher morale, okay, so that's good. So it's the idea of if you don't, if you don't address the recruitment challenges, it's not going to grow as it desires to okay so it's gonna have slow growth if if growth at all okay all right here is the last chapter that we're dealing with last chapter okay three questions uh what is the significance of conducting job simulations in the employee selection process okay so the job simulations is a form of a job test an employee test and it would be to assess candidates' technical knowledge and skills. Yes, that's quite possible. Essentially, the first couple steps in the employee selection process, you're asking people to, I wish I had the figure to actually help you guys out visualize it, but uh, essentially you're asking people for their knowledge, skills, and abilities and education, things like that. However, people can lie. The job simulation or an employee test is one way to test to see whether people actually have knowledge and skills. So I think that is the right answer. Let's check to see what the other ones. Candidates, leadership, management, abilities, leadership. Uh, well, possibly. Uh, it's definitely not this one. To negotiate salary benefits, definitely not that one. Hmm, what would I do? I, I might even do B, actually. No, it's A. 
le candidates' leadership and management abilities? I guess that would be more questions associated with interview questions, right? That kind of idea. So say I like uh, behavior, not behavior, um, situation-based questions, uh, behavior-based questions. So if you, uh, you know, based on this particular scenario, based on this particular scenario, uh, what would you do? Okay. Now, if you have an employee that does X, how would you manage them? Right. So I guess an interview question would be better, um, would be better. For, for these types of uh, evaluating individuals based on leadership and management abilities. Um, but job simulations, you can actually say, okay, um, here's, you're on a computer, um, here, kind of, I guess in some ways you could say, hey, it's just like the Markov analysis question we had before. I give you the simulation, hey, here's the, a Markov um, table, it's half filled out. Can you fill it out? Right, And that's more of your technical knowledge in terms of filling it out. Okay, that kind of idea. Uh, so what is the purpose of conducting a medical examination in the employee selection process? Um, physical fitness, right? Typical medical exam. Typically, medical exams, we're thinking of physical examinations. We're not talking about like a mental health. We're talking about physical health. Um, so in this case, it is uh, physical health. You could also talk about it from like a drug test perspective, uh, physical fitness. Yeah, like, like that kind of idea. Problem solving uh, is interviews, uh, ethical behavior, uh, interviews, case study, like case scenarios, uh, ability to handle stress. What you could do interview questions, but frankly, I think that best with that for that would be an employee test to see how to see whether they can solve a complex problem under a short time period in in, in terms of like a stressful environment. So a job simulation would actually be good for uh, trying to identify somebody's or assess somebody's ability to handle stress. Okay, uh, Global Solutions Inc. is a multinational corporation facing significant challenges in its employee selection process. Despite receiving a large number of applications for open positions, the company is struggling to identify and hire the most qualified candidates. Okay, so in this case, um, You've got a lot of people applying. Your recruitment worked. All that recruitment stuff and creating a diverse, diverse search, it worked. Um, but you have too many people that have, that have applied. Now you're trying, you're struggling to find the best person. Um, situ situation is leading to productivity issues and increased turnover among new hires. Ah, so it's the idea that you're hiring the wrong person. People are underperforming and people are leaving. Okay. So in this, it's pretty, it's pretty standard for a selection process. Okay. Uh, if it's not effective. So what is the primary issue in the selection process? Um, so reduced productivity is a, an outcome of the actual selection process. So that's not correct. Difficulty attracting. That's wrong. We're, we're crushing our attraction of the candidates. Challenging and identifying and hiring the most qualified candidate. That's correct. That is the main issue. Okay, the productivity challenge is what happens because you hired the wrong person. The same with retention issues. Okay, you hired the wrong person. They're underperforming and they're leaving. Okay, but the issue is you, you didn't hire the right person. Which of the following factors might contribute to this company's selection challenges? Uh, a lack of job applicants, and that is incorrect. It's the opposite. We have too many. A streamlined and efficient process. A generous conversation. <laughs> a streamlined and efficient selection process. It's so efficient that we are producing incorrect people. No, that's not right. Uh, unclear in job, unclear job uh, descriptions and qualifications. In, in this case, I have to admit, there is no reference to job descriptions up above, um, up here. When we're, where's my, th where's my button? Sorry. Uh, there's no reference to job descriptions, so you might be like, hmm, I don't know about that one. But the other answers are just so incorrect. This is the only possible answer that makes sense. Okay, so in that case, that's the the one that you would go with. That is the because I guess it says which which of the following factors might contribute. Even though, despite no job description and qualifications are even mentioned here, all of the other answers are just incredibly wrong. That one, one answer stands out. All right, the last question. 
Global Solutions Inc. Is uh, sorry, I already read that. Uh, one issue that is that was identified when analyzing the selection process was that there was a large number of applicants who lied on their job applications. Ooh, those liars, those bad, bad people. To minimize the effects of lying throughout the selection process, how could the selection think improve the selection process? It administer employee employment tests. Yes, my favorite answer. I love employment tests. Get those liars out of there. Uh, let's just make sure none of the answers seem legitimate. Multiple rounds of interviews. That's kind of a good idea as well. You know, you can triangulate the answers, but you know, once a liar, always a liar. Remember that, ladies. Um, have SMEs interview applicants. SME, if you don't know SME, subject matter expert. Uh, that could also work, frankly, because it's the idea that you'd have somebody who knows the, the detail asking people questions. So maybe they could ask more specific questions and get a better read on whether somebody knows the exact detail and exact technical knowledge of a part of something. Um, but again, an interview, you can still lie in an interview. Um, use technology for applicant screening. It's the idea that if, I, if I'm if i lying into a person, I can also lie on my resume or on my application. So using technology uh, is not going to help me. Okay. All right, guys, that that is it. We are done. We flew through these. There we go, a little picture of me in the middle. Uh, we flew through these questions. I hope you found this helpful. Our, my uh, midterm from last term, the class average again was 74%. I'm hoping, because you know, I, I don't know, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, no professor really wants a 74% grade point average for a first year class. Um, so I'm hoping that it's a little bit lower. I, I'm trying, I did try to make it a little bit more challenging. Not that I'm like the most evil person in the world, but instead of having four options, A, B, C, D, uh, I put five in there, you know, including one of those like all of the above, right? Because people find those a little bit more challenging questions. So I did make it a little bit more challenging just to be fully transparent. Um, but I do think if you were, if you, if you've gotten to this point in the video, you're probably going to do okay. Cause you've done multiple, uh, old exams. So I encourage you to do that old exams, go through your slides and you're going to crush the exam. Okay. Other than that, I will see you guys on Saturday. Looking forward to it. Um, good luck where you're studying. Take care.